So welcome back to the Sam Sorbo Show. I'm your host, Sam Sorbo. I'm joined by my guest now. I've had him on before. We had such a lively conversation. I thought, let's bring him back to talk about UFOs. He's a PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. He's a former geophysicist and a college professor, but we won't hold that against him. He now dis directs Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. And so he's here to talk about UFOs, uh, but you can also mention your book if you want. Nothing's off limits here. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Stephen C. Meyer. It's great to be with you again, Sam. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, the UFO thing really was, you know, all of a sudden they're divulging all this information about UFOs and we're seeing, you know, more and more sightings of them. It was just, right, all of a sudden UFOs were kind of everywhere for a minute. Well, a big buildup because there was a, a report released by the Navy on June 25th uh, to Congress. And uh, as I expected, it was completely inconclusive, per, uh, primarily because there are so many competing explanations of what they're now calling uh, uh, unidenti unidentified aerial phenomena. And um, so uh, I, I, my, my interest in this is... Uh, Wait, unidentified aerial phenomena is UAP. UAP, yes, not UFO, but I, it's, it's like, probably that does nothing for me. It, UFO it, it, is so much catchier. It, right? It's yeah, it's done nothing to settle the issue either. What exactly are these <laughs> these uh, these sightings or vision? What is they're, it? They're... I don't know. Let's change the name. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So there, there's you know of course various explanations. UFO enthusiasts thinks they, they might may be alien astronauts. Uh, the pilots have been uncertain. There's been concern that they might be uh, providing evidence of military capability from some of our competitor nations that we are unaware of. The the Navy the one thing the Navy did rule out is that they are they are the result of some new technology that we possess. Uh, another another uh, explanation is that they are kind of uh, visual mirages of various kinds produced by um, terrestrial aircraft. There's been Have one. Have ruled out Harry Potter? Harry Potter did not make it into the into the <laughs> the report, as best I know. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, my you know my interest in this, I've got a piece coming out in one of the national newspapers this weekend. Uh, and just pointing out that it's not just UFO enthusiasts and Navy pilots who have been talking about aliens. Uh, it's actually scientists have been talking about them for several decades as a possible explanation for the origin of life. And they've proposed alien intelligence because there are so many signs of intelligence inside living cells. And because it's turned out to be so very difficult to explain the origin of life on planet Earth. So the hypothesis is maybe these uh maybe the 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 signature of intelligence that we find in life and the digital code and dna and the whole complex processing system for information that we find in even the simplest cells is indicates that there was an intelligence involved in the origin of life but rather than proposing that that was uh evidence of divine creation some scientists have posited that the, the alien intelligence uh, alien astronaut a seeded life on earth after that alien intelligence e first evolved on some other planet and that really uh, kind of begs credulity like they just keep going farther and farther back at, and and really the argument that they propose is just with enough time so a thousand monkeys typing uh, on a thousand typewriters will eventually write shakespeare somewhere in the cosmos not, not here okay, right. not here not, mind maybe you not the here so not yeah, the conditions where I, where, weren't here i mean it, it seems so fanciful but no less a person uh personage than uh sir francis crick who was the co-discoverer of dna and very much aware of its information bearing properties uh, after all uh bill gates has said dna is like a software program but much more complex than any we've ever created. Richard Dawkins, the world's uh, greatest scientific atheist, has acknowledged that DNA is like a machine code. So you got software inside cells, which seems to suggest a master programmer for life. And so then the question is, where did the where did that programming happen? Where did that 
and uh, some have proposed out in space. Richard Dawkins actually <laughs> floated this idea uh, in a film you may have seen it was several years ago called Expelled with uh, Ben Stein. And near the end of the film, Ben got Richard Dawkins to acknowledge that quote, no one knows how life first evolved through chemical evolutionary processes, but uh, it, <clears throat> that, and, and therefore there, there might've been a quote, signature of intelligence in the cell, but he said, if so, it must have evolved through a purely natural means somewhere else in the cosmos. And it, you're right, it just, it begs the question because uh, of the ultimate origin of life and the ultimate origin of information, because it doesn't tell, it, it, it provides no explanation for how the information needed to build the first cell on some other planet arose from which then the alien intelligence would have presumably right. evolved and then sent life to earth. Uh, this is proposed- I think the ancient Aztecs sent a spaceship to a foreign planet so that that the they could plant life there and then life there actually sent life back here that there you go it, it's no it's no less fanciful is it i mean it's that's, circular, that's what yeah circular reasoning if, if we're gonna beg questions why not just beg some more you know <laughs> so right um Anyway, so that's uh, you know, so that's been the nature of my interest in this. There's actually this theory actually has a name. It's called panspermia or directed panspermia, and it's it's been at least floated by very serious scientists, Fred Hoyle, Sir Francis Crick, uh, and uh, even Richard Dawkins, who I now think probably regrets that because uh, he said it on camera. But uh, that was the. Um, and there, in, in, in my book, uh, Return of the God Hypothesis, I actually take this, hypo the, this hypothesis on and take it seriously for the following reason. When I previously made a case for intelligent design in my book, uh, Signature in the Cell, I didn't attempt to identify the designing intelligence. I just argued that an intelligence of some kind must be responsible for the information that we find inside living cells because information al always arises from an intelligence of some kind, whether we're talking about a computer pro program or a paragraph in a book or information embedded in a radio signal. Um, and there are, by the way, scientists looking for life in space who are looking for evidence of life in radio signals. They're looking for information embedded in a radio signal. It's called the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And while we haven't found any such evidence of intelligence in radio signals coming from space, the very informational signature that they're looking for is present in the DNA molecule. So you can see why people are thinking there must have been a mind, there must have been intelligence. But of course, positing intelligence in space doesn't solve the ultimate question, which is where did the information come from <laughs> to get life going there? And it also doesn't solve another question. And this is well, something they, I address. I'm just going to interject here. I think they'd, yeah, go ahead. Rather, they'd rather worship an alien creature than God. Yeah, uh, there is a religious impulse in this, no question. And Bill, ben Stein, after interviewing uh, Richard Dawkins, said uh, he, he, he characterized it as the ABG hypothesis, a anything but God. Anything but God. A yeah. But there's, there's something that the alien intelligence hypothesis definitely doesn't explain. It doesn't explain the origin of the universe, and it doesn't explain the fine tuning of the universe that physicists are talking about. This, the, the delicate balance of all these physical parameters that make not only life, but even basic chemistry possible. And many scientists now think that so, that points to a fine tuner, but that right. couldn't be an alien because the aliens evolved, presumably, long after the beginning of the universe when those fine tuning parameters were set. Right. So let's talk about the fine tuning parameter because it was either Dawkins or Hitchens who said that the the one the one argument that the atheists really can't respond to is the fine tuning argument. So explain the fine tuning argument if you don't mind and uh, let's just talk about that for a minute. Yeah, you bet. So <clears throat> the it was starting in about the 1950s and 60s the physicists began to dis, uh, discover that there were the, that there were many parameters of physics that could well have been otherwise for example the strength of gravitation or the strength of the force called the cosmological constant that's pushing the universe apart from outward from the big bang at the beginning or the masses of the elementary particles 
And physicists now characterized our universe, now characterize our universe as sometimes they call it a fortunate universe or a Goldilocks universe, where the fundamental forces are not too strong, not too weak, the masses of the elementary particles are not too heavy, not too light, the speed of light is not too fast, not too slow, all these things are just right. And uh, Fred Hoyle, who was uh, once an atheist, later having discovered some of these parameters said that uh, a, a common sense interpretation of the data such suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry and that there are no blind forces in nature we're talking about that uh, fine tuning points to a fine tuner but the well, can interesting I just, yeah I go just ahead want to interject because I love that um, the idea that physics and the laws of physics exist they predate the universe the laws of mathematics predate the universe. Well, they, they certainly predate the origin of any would-be aliens or us. <laughs> and they, they were set. Or the Air you, Force, for that yeah, matter. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the, the, the fine-tuning parameters were set either at the very beginning of the universe or soon after. And long before any uh, complex organism could have evolved. For right, the so first... when we talk about fine tuning, we're saying, and you can look this, you can look this up in um, Stephen Hawk, Stephen Hawking's book. Stephen Hawking talks about it. Yeah. Most of the major, the leading physicists acknowledge that fine tuning is a real phenomenon that so, needs an explanation. In other words, if the force of the explosion had been, I think it's one times ten to the twenty seventh of a degree, uh, you know, that much off then it wouldn't have expanded and formed the planets. It would have collapsed. If it had been that much greater, it wouldn't have formed the solar system. It would have continued to expand. And so even he admits that there isn't a, a, a plausible explanation for not just that, but the idea that we have that, we have the gravitational constant which is what it is. We have all of these other parameters that fit together. That's the fine tuning thing, is that it's this, um, this co coalition of coincidences that it, it's too, too much to be explained away with, well, it was just by accident. And the, the further argument is, if evolution just happened by accident, why aren't we still seeing it today? If we, if I evolved from an ape, why, why is there still the ape? What, what happened to those guys that they didn't evolve? And, well, and uh, then, yeah, absolutely. I get asked this a lot, and of course, one of the most obvious common sense observations that we all make is that like begets like. You know, dogs produce right. dogs, and frogs produce frogs. And, and I didn't uh, give birth to toasters. Yes, exactly. Or giraffes. And and so the the postulation from the neo darwinists are giraffes. The 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 neo darwinists say, well, you know, give it enough time, very small changes add up. But what we see is that the the processes that produce small changes that we can observe tend to degrade the genetic information that's present in living systems and to build something new you can't degrade information you need new information it's just like in the computer world if you want to give your computer a new function you've got to provide new code and so the question is where does all that information come from at the point of the first life the origin of life and the point of the big explosions that we see in the fossil record like the cambrian explosion where you get completely new forms of life arising Th that new information i think indicates the activity of mind but back to the fine tuning Yes. Uh, you're right. It's present from the very beginning, and therefore it it can't be explained by us or by any alien intelligence within the cosmos. We don't even have atoms for the first 380,000 years after the big the Big Bang. It's a plasma state, and yet the initial arrangement of matter and energy, physicists tell us, was fine tuned to an unimaginable level of precision. The number they use is one part in ten to the tenth power raised again to the 123rd power, where they call it a hyper exponential number. You can't even get your mind around the level of precision that's involved there. So off a little bit this way or that way, we don't get stable galaxies, we don't get planets, we don't get anything. We don't even get basic chemistry with many of these parameters unless they're exactly finely tuned. And so the, exp the go-to explanation for that among uh, secular physicists 
is as weird as the alien designer hypothesis. They posit that uh, there are billions and billions of other universes out there that are disconnected, unconnected from our own, and that we just happen to be in the lucky universe where the parameters ended up just right, whereas all those other ones got it wrong, and therefore it's, it was just a, a, a crapshoot, and, and it was all of, it was still a, a chance explanation. We won at roulette. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we won at roulette. I mean, it's it's so it just makes me laugh because it's like, hey, my computer's not working. Well, why don't you hire a guy to fix it? No, no, evolution will take care of it. Eventually, it'll work again. In some universe, somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's so you know, it, it, everything. We wouldn't. Ex- you're absolutely right, Sam. But we wouldn't accept these types of explanations in any other realm of experience. Right. But this is what the atheist scientists have been forced to invoke these types of explanations. Uh, uh, in order to explain these really powerful evidences of design, digital code in cells, fine tuning in the laws of physics. And then the big question, the biggest question of all, where did the universe come from? We now know that the physical universe, as best we can tell, had a beginning. Matter and energy, space and time weren't always here. They came into existence a finite time ago not by some alien, because the aliens within the cosmos, it couldn't cause the cosmos to, to come into existence. Uh, and instead, this, this is the basis of, of what's sometimes called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. To explain the origin of the universe as a whole a finite time ago requires some entity which is outside matter, space, time, and energy, and could act to bring something new into existence. And insofar as theism, the traditional belief in God posits the existence of such an entity, it provides a much better explanation for the origin of the universe than mm, some sort of matter and energy. Because after all, that's what comes into existence at the beginning. Before that, there is no matter and energy to do the causing. Or time. Or time. Or time. Yeah, the, it requires a, a, an agent that lives or, or exists independently of our space and time. And Remind problem- you of anyone? Yeah. <laughs> And the problem, really, the, the, the problem that we face is that our laws of physics, which we accept now as being proven, uh, postulate that there is no reaction without an initial action. And so the universe doesn't exist without somebody acting, something acting. And so if there's nothing, then nothing acted, then nothing evolved. From nothing, nothing comes. Exactly. And so and the idea that God spoke and created everything is is really the the foundational idea. So, um, right. And every worldview has to uh, answer that basic question: What is the thing, or the entity, or the process from which everything else came? And the dominant default worldview of the scientific community from the late 19th century forward has been something called materialism, the idea that matter and energy are the things from which everything else came, and they were here eternally, and they were self-existent in the same way that uh, Jews and Christians think of God as eternal and self-existent. But the one thing that we now know, as best, as best we can tell from multiple lines of evidence, is that matter and energy and the, uni- the universe of space and time we're not here eternally. They are not. They they are not a good candidate to be the thing from which everything else came, because they pop into existence a finite time ago, and and one of the basic rules of reasoning, one of the most fundamental principles of rationality, is the principle of causality. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Well, if the universe began to exist, it must have a cause. But causes are separate from themselves, so it can't be the realm of matter, space, time, and energy that caused the universe to come into existence. That's what begins to exist. Right. Okay. So uh, Stephen C. Meyer is the author of uh, *Return of the God Hypothesis*, which is a fascinating book and and really very timely, in fact. And I think uh, I'm I'm. I'm feeling like we are on the verge of a great, another awakening. And I'm very hopeful about that. Um, I wanted to ask you one last question before I let you go. The timing of all of these UFO announcements, do you have any comment on the timing of like why all of a sudden we're getting all of this download now? You know, I really don't. It's puzzling to me too, Sam. Uh, we've had people talking about this since the 50s, you know, with the sightings in Roswell and and 
uh, and why the the Navy should suddenly release this, I I really don't know. The, uh, the one thing that that has been very is very apparent is once they've released the report, it has not settled the issue at all. And uh, so, yes, also, and that that to me is highly suspect. Also, and so I look at it as a distraction, and it's a very pleasant distraction. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I enjoy you. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on again. I appreciate All it. All right. Stephen yeah. C. Meyer, the author of Return of the God Hypothesis. Quick break here for those of you on radio and podcast. I'll be right back. And uh, thanks so much for joining me. Mm-hmm. 